Today we're going to be working on Unit 4. I know that Unit 3 was up on my screen there for just a second, but we are moving into uh, Chapter 7 tonight. And we're not going through the whole chapter, mind you. Please be aware of the page numbers that I have posted up top here. Um, and I actually tweaked those a little bit because I realized the materials that we're covering kind of go past page 339. Um, so they might have added a page or two since the last printing of the book. Um, but we're going through the first portion of the chapter to cover very specific topics. So this chapter does go well beyond what we're covering in this unit. Uh, and I'm thinking that we're revisiting it later on uh, in the course. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and just jump right into the PowerPoint here and get that rolling. And it should be the very last one I had opened up here with any luck. And of course, it's over here on the wrong screen. All right, so this is <laughs> a PowerPoint with almost 90 slides in it, so I promise I'm not going through all of them. Uh, this chapter covers a lot of topics, but we are not covering all of these topics here. There's just too much to cover and it's a little bit deeper than what we're ready for right now. So what we're really looking at is really the, the, the first uh, few uh, bullet points here. Let's start by uh, going to slide number three and talk about a couple of definitions really quick that are pretty important for you to understand. Um, you don't necessarily hear a lot of people like throwing these acronyms out there, but they are uh, some unique things that I think are pretty important that you need to be aware of. So uh, within working with SQL or SQL, whatever you choose to call it, there's two kind of sub approaches within that structure that we use to accomplish certain tasks. And they, and they fall into these first two categories here. So right now we're only looking at these first two bullets, okay? So we're looking at DDL and DML. And the difference is basically one is data definition language and the other one is data manipulation language. And those are really not necessarily languages per se, but really more about the techniques we're employing and what category they fit into. That's the way that I think about it. Um, so I don't necessarily think of them as a separate language unto themselves, uh, although some people might argue that they are. So let's uh, move on to the next slide and get a little bit more of a uh, insight. So th the first portion is what we call the data definition language. And it's, notice the, the definition here. It says, used for creating tables, relationships, and other structures. So even right down to actually creating the database itself, this is a lot of what we're doing in this early part of the chapter here is looking at this sort of an approach. So far, we've been working with databases where the content is given to us. We're not really creating anything. We're just using what's already there. But now we're stepping into uh, the approach where we've looked a little bit at logical design, and now we're going to start building things using some of the techniques that we've learned. Now, the data manipulation uh, language are your basic query statements is the way that I think of them. You know, so if you, if you start thinking about these two things in different categories. One is for kind of building the structure, and the other one is for uh, basically extracting or manipulating the information. So if you look at some of the things that are here, these are things for the most part that we've already done, right? Mm, sort of. And, and, and here's why I say sort of. So far, we haven't really been inserting or updating data so far, have we? or deleting anything, but we certainly have been selecting a whole bunch of it. In fact, that's been our focus, really. It's just a, let, what data can we pull out? How are we pulling it out? Now, we're gonna add to it, really what I consider an extension of the select statement, which is insert, that's where we take information and add it to a table, update, change a record that's already there, or delete and simply remove a record. But you see how those really don't change the structure of the database, they're just changing the information stored in it. And that's really, for me, the clear delineating point between what is DDL and what is DML is that simple fact, right? One is to build a structure, 
So building the database, creating the tables, the other, um, and the relationships of foreign keys and joins and things. And then DML is simply to you know, manipulate or extract the information that's already in the structure. Some of the other uh, terminology here, and you can see in, in the left uh, sidebar here, these additional slides that we're not talking about yet. Okay, But there is this thing called uh, you know, persistent stored modules, not something we're doing quite yet. There's also transaction control language, which is um, you know, part of the SQL language, long story. Um, but once again, we're not covering it here. And there's also data control language, um, which really is about working with permission sets mostly, and that's not our topic yet either. In the book, if you were reading the book sequentially, so if you were like chapter one, chapter two, and going through all their examples in that fashion, um, which is what we've opted not to do here at Gateway, by the way, uh, you would be working with this sample database. And they have you go through the process of designing it, and then in this chapter they have you build it. So there's a number of slides here that relate to that that I am now skipping over, um, just so you can uh, see that. Um, and the next thing I'm going to stop at slide number 14, just to kind of further push this concept of the difference between DDL and DML. So if you look at the the, the columns on the left where they talk about those two specific technologies, you'll see the, the commands that, that work with those particular uh, pieces. So for DDL, we create the database, or create the table, alter the table, drop the table, or truncate the table. And those are all fairly common commands that you learn. And then with uh, DML, once again, you'll see the insert, update, delete, and then another one thrown into the mix here called merge. And you can kind of very intuitively guess what that one does. Um, in the second column on the right, those are some of the more advanced things that we are not touching yet in this chapter. Uh, but if you're curious, of course, you're welcome to read ahead. Not really a big deal. All right. So they're going to jump in, uh, in here right to this create table statement and here's where I'm going to kind of put the brakes on just a little bit I, and I really what I'm trying to do is show you kind of my my school of thought on this in terms of how you should approach uh, doing this stuff so I'm going back to page 324 in the book so I'm bringing the actual book up on the screen and, and once again kind of reviewing some of the same information and this is where I was having this little struggle earlier on what would be a good approach uh, for presenting this tonight. Um, and, and, I, and the reason I'm doing this is for, it's multifold, but it's for a couple things to point out that you shouldn't just get the information fr of, from your textbook from looking at the PowerPoints. That really is pretty important to read the book because you are gonna be filling in a lot of blanks that um, aren't, in, aren't in the slides, frankly. So one thing that I do wanna point out is here on uh, page 325, they bring into the mix this thing they call the System Development Life Cycle, or what we call the SDLC, which is a formalized approach for project work in information technology. And if you happen to be in like uh, IT and business or the Intro to MIS class, or happen to be taking a project class in one of the other programs, whether it's web or uh, CSS or networking or software development, we go through talking about systems analysis and design and the importance of it. And so really what they're trying to tell you here is if you're not familiar with what this is, you need to kind of educate yourself a little bit. We do in our programs, depending on what program you're taking and where you are in the program, we talk about these concepts. And my goal right now is not to like completely school you on systems methodologies. That's not really the point. But it is important to know that if you are working on a database project, which is very common when you're doing a systems project, to have some sort of database on the back end, whether it's a web app or a whatever, it's very common to involve databases. And part of what you're doing there is you're really taking a close look at what information you need, how you need it to be structured and thought of in advance. So that's why they're mentioning it here. 
you don't just willy-nilly start building tables. It takes, it's a process, and very often you have a team of people doing it, you have discussions about it, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, what's most efficient, et cetera, and then you build what makes sense as opposed to what does not. So that, that's really the point of that there. The other thing that they're gonna try to stress here very strongly is don't try to do this work without a proper database tool. So whatever database product you're using, and I like that the book is set up so that it's flexible. So they're not just push, pushing access or SQL Server. They have the instructions for Oracle or MySQL. And all the stuff that we're learning here in this chapter, once again, will translate nicely to any one of those environments. Although, there are some little hitches for when you actually create the databases, and we'll look at that when we get to it. All right. They once again have that discussion about how uh, DDL and DML um, break down. And when they go to the structural part here, they go right to create table. If you look at our unit folder, what we did in addition is we also added this little blurb here right in the unit four folder to talk about the syntax for creating a database because we are jumping around in the book a little bit. So one of the first things we're gonna do is when we get busy is we're gonna practice doing that task, all right? And you can see the syntax that goes with it is not necessarily very clear cut. So if you look at this statement here, this, is, this comes right from the, the documents that explain how to do this particular type of creation. And you notice that to create a database, I mean really you don't need very much to actually create the database. You can just simply say create database, give it a name, put in a semicolon and you're done. And in essence, you have a blank database. And you know what? That's exactly where I'm going to start, you guys. That's, that's, a, that's going to be step one for us, is it's to very simply create one. Now, if you're thinking in advance, right, which sometimes people do, okay, for various reasons, and then there's other times where people are like, it's just enough to create it, we'll deal with the rest later. Okay, and, and both are perfectly valid approaches. But if you're forecasting, it is possible, like the SQL files that we've worked with, to plan ahead, create the database, create the tables, insert the data all in one fell swoop. That is pretty ambitious, though. I think for most designers, if you create a database and create the tables in one step, that's kind of acceptable. Although my personal pattern has always been, I kind of like to pour the foundation first and then put on the two by fours rather than do it all in one fell swoop. So I usually create the database first and then create the table separately. That's my thinking, okay? That's not necessarily the best approach. I'm just saying that that's my thinking. But if you are choosing to create a database, and like, you know, for example, I said, just that first line is really enough to create the database. And then you just stick a semicolon at the end of it and you can do the work. However, if you're working in a database management system, there's other considerations to make. First of all, you know, what is the name unique? Uh, what's actually going to be the, the file that, that you create by doing this? What's the size? Are you limiting the size that it can grow to? And all of these can be specified as parameters along with a whole bunch of other features. So what's shown here in the example, the first example, is a pretty verbose output, or statement, I should say, not output, um, indicating that we are gonna create a database with very specific features. And not only that, um, not only create the database with certain features, but you notice the second little portion of it there that says log on. It doesn't mean you're signing in, folks. What does that mean? You're creating a log of all the stuff that's going on in the database in a separate file. That's considered a good practice. Now the question I would throw out there is, if I don't include that, will it log everything? Here's the answer to the question. It depends on the product you're using. That's the answer. So those that are paranoid will go in there and get very specific and they'll want the file in a certain place, named a certain way, but many of our database products will automatically log the stuff anyhow. So functionally, in many cases, you can really skip 
uh, these pieces here, depending on the kind of work you're doing. If you're working on a system where you're sharing space, or your SQL Server is running, I don't know, a hundred other databases, that kind of thing does happen, then you have to start thinking about disk space and growth and how you're allocating things. So what's the file growth? The file growth allows the actual file that we're creating to grow to a certain uh, size in increments specified by this. So in other words, it's going to add 16 megs of space each time it grows. Okay. That, that's what that indicates. Does that help? Yeah. yeah. I mean, because here you're already like pre-declaring a size, and how big are we making it? Well, 200 meg, basically. Um, and here we're going to add 16 meg every time we grow. So we don't just want to give it just enough room. We want to give it a little more right, every time it, it grows. Uh, it also is set to max size unlimited, meaning that if the database keeps growing, we're going to keep growing. Let's just hope our servers can support it, right? And in some cases, you know, server admins will know. It's like, well, it can't go unlimited. I mean, we could fill this thing up in a day. You know, that, that might be a realistic scenario. Um, so what happens in those situations? Well, then you find yourself migrating your database or adding storage space or whatever you have to do to keep it running. Now, the hope is whenever you're building a database that you have ample room on whatever machine you're using, but that's not always realistically the case. So just, just be aware of that. The, um, the log file can also be controlled. You notice the log file is not very big. So that would indicate um, that we're starting with a pretty small file and we're just going to let it grow as, as we keep going. Some people will cap their log files and then basically older transactions just get deleted automatically, but you know that's kind of a, a personal choice. Another thing that we can do is something that we've already done, and we've played with this a couple of different ways. The way that we played with this, remember our first assignment where you guys imported the AdventureWorks database? And with that one, we actually used the tools in SQL Server to restore a database and insert it. That's one way of doing it. We're just using the tools in the product. Another way that you can do it is by actually pulling one in just like this. So what we have going on here is that database file and instead of restoring the database, in this case you're actually creating a new database and pointing it to which file it is that you want that's already a database in structure, right? So it already has tables and everything's linked together um, and we're just pulling that in. Okay, so those are basically the two functional ways. Now from there, our, our book goes into creating tables. So now, that's why I interjected my little piece, right? Because we have to know how to create databases first. And then we're going to go into uh, creating tables. Now, there's a general form for doing this, but the statement to do it is basically the first three words that you see listed on the slide here. So you just say create table and give it a name. Now there is an assumption that you're already attached to the correct database. So you want to be careful with this command because if you're creating a table, my strong suggestion is make sure that your SQL statement's got a use statement above it so we know that we're attaching it to the right database. So all of a sudden you're not like adding a table to the wrong database, especially when you're working, working with multiples. So that's a kind of the, the, the basic format. Um, and then inside a set of parentheses, you notice the parentheses here, what most people will do is they'll create a list separated by commas of all the columns that they're putting together. And they're going to have some examples coming up here that we'll look at. But the, the basic approach is the name of the column, the type of data that it contains, and then optionally the constraint that goes with it. So a constraint might be the fact that it's a primary key, or it's a foreign key, or whether or not it can be null or not null. Those are the most common uh, things that, that you have. The other thing that you can throw in is also constraints for the table itself, but that's a little bit of a separate issue. What are some of the constraints? Well, we talked about those uh, quickly, and here's kind of a quick little list. Now, primary keys and foreign keys are not allowed to have null values because this is where we're linking between tables. So they're assuming that you've already thought this through, 
about what makes sense to build, like we did with the parking ticket thing. So we looked at that structure. So we already identified what the primary and foreign keys are. And in that case, we know in advance that we're, when we're building those tables that we can't allow those to be known. And by virtue of the fact that they're primary and, primary and foreign key, uh, that fits into that situation. You can also decide that it doesn't make sense or it does make sense to allow null values or not. So how about like, for example, the driver's license field? Now our assumption would be if you're giving somebody a ticket, they must have a driver's license. Well, I can assure you that there's people out there without driver's licenses getting tickets. So that kind of blows that a little bit, doesn't it, right? So you would have to like, think about whether you would allow a null value. So I can't put in a driver's license number for somebody who doesn't have one. So that's kind of an interesting little thing. The other thing is, is you can make sure that a value is unique or not. Now in some cases, the uniqueness is usually enforced by the primary or foreign key. Uh, but in some cases, maybe not. So maybe uh, you walk into a store and you do a transaction and you buy something, well the transaction number is probably a unique value and it needs to be in order to work with whatever other system you're connecting to. So it doesn't necessarily make it a key field, but it does mean that it needs to be unique. Uh, and then we also have the, the, the check. Now they make um, a point here about uh, the default keyword. Now you can actually preset database uh, data to actually put in a default value right off the bat, right? It depends on the kind of thing that you're doing, um, but technically we don't really call that a constraint, it's just kind of like a, a feature is kind of the way that I look at it. Now they have some examples here from their sample database, but here's a, here's a SQL statement that shows how to do a create, and I like it because it's very nicely laid out. Now I, I wanna, want you to keep in mind that the indenting that you see here and the, the columns that they're forming are highly subjective. You do not need to lay it out like that. But at the same time, it's easy to read, right? So I would suggest that you, that you use a format that's nice and, and easy to read like that. Uh, no reason not to. But notice create table, the name of the table. All of these are the names of the columns, right? Uh, the data types that are associated with those. Now, we haven't really talked about the data types much, uh, at least not in the form of lecture here. And then whether or not something can be not null and whether or not something is a primary key. Now, notice how they, they put in the primary key here. They actually list it as a constraint independent of the fact that it's listed as a field above. Okay. Now it says artist PK. Is that field listed anywhere else? No. And, and people will have different approaches to this. Some people will list their primary keys first. Some people will list them last. Functionally, it doesn't really matter. It's just a matter of how you like looking at things. The order in which you create the columns, though, will be the order in which they appear in the table by default. So that's important to know. But the fact that artist PK is the primary key, that's pretty important. And notice how they're, they're putting it in here. Primary key is artist ID. So you see how they're defining it? They're really saying that this first field here is unique. Okay? And that the whole table is built around it in essence. So every artist must have a unique identifier. The, the next thing that they're doing is they're, they're saying artist AK1, it says unique, last name, first name. What is that? Now we don't know anything about their table really, do we? No, we don't. We don't understand the logic behind it. But what they're saying here in essence is that the last name and first name combined hypothetically should be unique unto themselves. And, and the way that you can kind of think about that, um, and we know that it happens in reality, that sometimes people have the same last and first name. But we can combine that with 
the artist ID to really form a truly unique entity. So the artist ID and the, and, and the last name and uh, full name. So this is basically kind of like a symbolic structure that indicates a combination of these two fields and hopefully being unique. Now, as an artist goes, and, and this, is, this is my take on it, in reality, I can't force people to have different last and first names. But if I was an artist, and I'm thinking maybe like, like a music or a movie artist, I probably wouldn't want to have two John Waynes in the same movie. You know, that's kind of, I think, the thinking here. So that, that's why they have that. All right. All right, another example of uh, doing this, so they have the artist table and then they have a work table. They, once again, they're doing a bunch of uh, constraints here, once again, working off of some of the same uh, structures. But then here they're also throwing in the foreign key, which is why I wanted to show this one. And the foreign, foreign key is the artist ID that's coming in from this other table. My question. Yes. Is that a case thing for alternate key? I don't really understand what the alternate key yeah. was. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's their, it's their way of kind of taking two fields that are already there, okay. combining them together, checking to see if they're unique and giving them a name as a construct. Okay. I, I hope that makes sense. Do you have to do that? No, you don't have to do that. That's just something they chose to do. Okay. I just didn't really understand the concept of an alternate key. That's well, the alternate, it's kind of like, um, really it's done more for indexing than anything else. Okay. But they're, they're putting it together. So in other words, they're saying that the title and the copy, I'm not sure what copy stands for here, but, but when you think of this one, where it says last name, first name, okay, well, I can kind of see that as being a combination thing that might be unique, you know? Um, and really what they're doing is, they're hoping it is because they're not gonna allow other artists with the same combo, mm -hmm. so that's the way of kind of forcing that. Okay. So even if you came in with the same last name, first name, they're, what they're saying is, uh-uh. Uh Somebody's already John Wayne. You have to be John Wayne Jr. or something, you know? That's why Michael, it's Michael J. Fox. That's why he had to be J. Right. Yeah. And that happens to artists. I don't know why they, they worry about that. Um, the other thing that's interesting here is they've also added this references thing, and we haven't talked about this yet. Um, but they're saying that if you start messing with stuff in this table, that affects the artist ID, if you update or delete anything in this table, that it will not affect the artist ID in that table. Yeah. That, that's all that means, very simply. All right, I'm gonna fast forward now. Uh, let's see, I'm going to slide number 26. All right. The other thing that they're starting to throw in here, and I know this is getting a little hard to read here, so I'm just giving it a couple clicks of zoom, is as they kind of ramp up their example, they also have this check field. So I kind of glossed over that earlier. But in some cases, you can enforce what values people put into a table. So. For example, here they're saying that you, the only nationalities allowed here are Canadian, English, French, German, Mexican, Russian, Spanish, and United States. So if I come marching along and I'm from, you know, I don't know, what's the country that's under? France. No, France is in there. Greece. Yeah, Greece, right? So if you're Greek, it's not allowed, you know, for whatever reason. And you can kind of enforce that as a constraint. So in that regard, a constraint to me makes a lot of sense. Um, now you're giving that constraint a name, but you're checking nationality so that it's part of these values. All right, so they're just setting up parameters, basically. Um, the other thing that they're putting in here is to check for birth dates so that they're less than, so you can't put it in a deceased date and then say that you were born on a date after it, just for example. Um, here, so they wouldn't allow that to happen. Here they're also checking if the birth year is valid, so it has to be in certain number ranges. 
uh, and the death year is also valid. So you make the new name for each of those That's correct. Okay. And then, yes, that forms a column, okay. or forms an entity that you can check against. That's really what's what's happening. So there's not a column there? But, you know, it, it's, it's creating an entity, it's not necessarily a column, so I, I apologize okay, for, for confusing like that. Or they values check, it's not they yeah. or It's right. checking it, okay. it's checking uh, the, the field that's listed here to make sure it fits in these ranges. So it's this construct that's formed that's not part of the table, but we're checking against it. Okay. It's just giving it a name. So I think that, you know, to me, I, I'm, I'm hoping that that is kind of clear. Um, but let's talk about a, a little bit about some of these data types. Um, now this is where it's helpful to have the programming background folks, right? What's an int? An integer, right? Counting number. What's a, what's a car, or C-H-A-R, and what's a 25 stand for? Number of characters. And then C-H-A-R implies what? Yeah, it's all the characters. So then what's the difference between var car and car, as we say in the database world? Variable. Variable characters. So what does this one allow that this one does not? Bingo. And spaces. Yeah, and spaces. And in some cases, special characters, too. Now, I'm going to give you just a little piece of advice. Now, most people's names tend to be characters only. But there are those weird individuals out there. <laughs> I can't think of any offhand, but I'm I sure there's probably a, what's that? Hyphenated last names. Hyphenated last names, or you get, you know, like the artist formerly known as Prince or somebody like that who's got a symbol as a name. I don't know if or that symbol um, exists on the keyboard. The O2. Yeah. Yeah, so some, some people, you know, it's po to me, Often, I'll just choose Varkar for everything, just to play it on the safe side. That, that's just kind of my rule of thumb. But they have a very specific thing here that they're doing. Now, this is kind of interesting. Why is it that for a postal code, I can use character, not Varkar? Because it's all numbers. Yeah, so it allows numbers. Right. Characters allows for numbers. The Varkar allows for the extended characters. That's really... Our, our clue there. All right. All right. Next thing we're going to do is take a really quick look at this alter table uh, statement, and that's kind of towards the tail end of our readings. Um, and this technically falls into the category of DDL, um, and it we use this to take a table that we already have and change it. I mean, it's really kind of as simple as that. So if we have a table and we say, oh my God, we have to, we have too many columns. Let's get rid of this column. There's no point of it. We can use the alter command. If we need to add a column or change what the column is, this is the command that we use to do it. So here's the general syntax of that. So just use the keyword alter, choose, um, say the keyword table, and then the table that you're changing. And, you know, in my experience, this most often is to add or drop columns, just like what you see here. So if you're gonna add a column, you would indicate the new name, the data type, and whatever constraint goes with it, just like you would when you're defining it from the beginning. Not a big deal. If you're just simply removing one, you just say drop, column, the name of the column, run the command and it's gone. What happens to the data that's in the column if, it, if there's data there? Yeah, it's gone. And guess what? It's a database. Unless you're pulling it from a backup, you're not pulling it back either. It's gone, it's gone, gone. There's no recycle bin, okay? So whenever you're using that drop command, you know, I always tell people when you're working with databases and you're gonna go do 
you're dropping a table, you're dropping a column, anything you're dropping, it's always like, are you sure? I mean, are you really sure? You know, because once it's gone, it's gone. And then good luck. I mean, I try to Transaction? Yeah, it's, uh, I'm not sure what you're shooting for there, Vaughn. Uh, you run, you run your like, inserts and all that stuff. The transform? No, no, no. Well, uh, let, <laughs> let, me, let me just give you this piece of advice when it comes to dropping stuff. If you have a functional reason to drop something because you, you really truly don't need it and never use it, do it. Right? My other school of thought on this is if you have a column that you're not really using in your reports, nobody's really putting data in there, but there is some data in there, right? And it might have some value. Why drop it? You know, so I, I always tell people, you know, think about that first. You don't have to go, just exclude it from your queries if you don't need it. It's not going to hurt anything It's just being there. And, and my thinking often is it's better to have too much data than not, not enough. Um, they get an Oh, gotcha, gotcha. So the, the beginning commit transaction, basically. Um, all right, so if you wanted to go through the trouble of uh, adding a constraint, so for example, if you want to check to see if something is part of a certain uh, array of entries or whatever, you can do that. Um, or you can actually go through and drop a constraint using the same approach if you have one that's in there that's named. And that's the beauty of naming a constraint is that you can just drop it by name. Okay, what happens if you're adding constraint the data that's in there does not meet the construction? The data is not allowed. So, so if I if I typed Greek into the column, right. it wouldn't let me no, close up the record. No, but what happens if you already had Greek in the column and then you add the constraint? Well, then you have a problem with data integrity. Okay. Yeah. Will it get an error or something? Because that's what Access does doesn't let you it, do it. Well. <laughs> Yeah, it will, it will cause some issues. Now, depending on the database system that you're using, right. some database systems will let the old data pre-exist, mm -hmm. and some will squawk like crazy. Okay. It just depends on the problem. And it depends on what you're doing with it. Mm -hmm. So typically, when, when you have that constraint in there, it's going to find the problem and want you to remove it, okay. although it won't necessarily remove it by brute force. Mm -hmm. Some database systems will have scripts that will, by brute force, Sanitize that data, basically remove it. What if you have an application that's trying to access the data, do we have an application, or if you try to go select from it? Yeah. But you get the constraint that Right. And, and see, like if you were, let's say, going through that process where you added a constraint and then some of the pre existing data doesn't fit, chances are, I'm, I'm hoping, that you'd be smart enough to go through there and sanitize it first. That would be the smart approach. And Not that that always happens. I mean, we'll throw up an error saying that some of your old data has a message. Once again, it depends on the database system. Okay. So you'll put in the you'll put in the constraint, and uh, some some of them won't even allow it to happen until you mm -hmm. take care of it, and others will just let it happen and say you got stuff that doesn't work, and that's up to you to take care of it. So hopefully that. It's not a very clear answer. The problem is, is we're talking about multiple database systems. So, all right, moving on to the next topic, which is uh, removing uh, a table. And removing a table is really just as simple as saying drop uh, the table and then give it a, the name of the table and the whole table's gone. Once again, same caution. Whenever you're working with any sort of a structure um, and you're just kind of brute force getting rid of it, I mean, Hopefully you know what you're doing when you're dropping it. You can also, of course, drop a database. So you can add that same uh, command to a database. And once again, be really, really careful what you're doing uh, because you can really cause a lot of problems uh, removing data, especially when you have uh, you know, links between tables. You, know, you have joins or you have primary and foreign keys going on. Um, you really kind of have to plan ahead a little bit. So the one wise thing to think about here, folks, is whenever you're building a database from scratch, you really need to think pretty carefully. 
you know, about how you're going to build it before you build it. You don't just willy-nilly build a database. Especially once you start populating it with data, because it, the command of dropping a table is pretty easy to execute, but practically impossible to resurrect, especially if you lose the information. So I always say back up significantly um, <laughs> before you proceed. Um, you can also do these uh, alter table commands where you drop constraints and then drop the table. Now, notice what it says here. It says, as an alternative, we can drop only the customer table if we first drop the constraints associated with the two tables as follows. So if we have constraints in there that are tied to the foreign key of a different table, it's not going to let us drop it. And how the database will squawk at you will depend. So once again, this takes a little bit of planning. You need to know what those connections are. So those diagrams that we make are not just for show. They're for function. And it's really important that you understand your structure uh, before you do that. Let's take a quick look at uh, the truncate command. Um, and as it says, uh, you remove all the data from a table while leaving the table structure intact. Well, that's kind of interesting. So you're saying, I'm going to get rid of all the stuff in the table, but I'm leaving the table alone. Why on earth would you want to do that? I don't know. I could probably think of a couple dozen reasons. But maybe you have like an annual raffle or something, right? And last year's raffle is done. So let's truncate the table, and we've got a new raffle this year, so we got a fresh table. Okay. I don't need to rebuild it. That would be one uh, reason to do that. Um, notice, though, a couple of little restrictions on this. Can't be used with a table that is referenced by a for foreign key constraint. So once again, you have to remove the constraint first and then do that. Um, and it says reset surrogate key value to your initial value if something is preset. Now, we're not really worried a lot about uh, indexes quite yet, but an index is really a way for us to keep track of a table independent of any of the content within it. So in other words, if I put in uh, a table of students with their student ID numbers and their names and addresses, I could run an index on it, and what the index does is it organizes the information and catalogs it. So when we say Google indexes the internet, that's basically what they do. They go to pages, they store the information, they create an index so they can look the stuff up. If you can think of what an index is, think of the old school library where you walk in and you go up to the card catalog and they had indexes for author, subject, and title. Same information, just organized in different ways. And so you can create indexes uh, for your information. The whole point of an index is what it says there. It improves, improves database performance. So if Google did not have their search results indexed, their search engine would not work nearly as well as it does. So not something that we're really focusing on in this chapter, but there was a slide. So, All right, let's move on to the insert statement, which is a pretty important one. Um, and. Typically, you know, once a database is created, um, oops, didn't need to do that. Typically, once a database is created, um, this is one of the most common things that we're going to do programmatically to a database. So, if like you're a programmer, most often you'll be writing some sort of an application that captures data from a form, or you know, some sort of a screen or whatever, and then pumps it into the database. Number one action that programmers do and most database people do for that matter. So the way that this statement is structured, you insert into whatever table you name and then based on the order of the columns you've declared, which may or may not, and this is really important, may or may not actually match up with the order that they're in the table. So I might have my table might be first name, last name. And here I say last name, first name, so it's going to insert it in the order that I've listed, not in the order that the table is structured. You guys get that part? All right, so that, that's pretty critical. And then inside uh, sets of parentheses, we then insert the values 
verbatim as listed. Notice the numeric values don't have quotes around them while the uh, strings do. So any of the character values. So Miro will go into last name, Joan will go into first name, Spash to nationality, date of birth, date deceased. All right. If you go ahead and do something like this, insert into artist values, and you don't declare the field names, it's going to insert the things just the order that the table is structured. So if you know that order, great. If you don't, problem, right? Because you can get things in the wrong spot. But you can do that, totally. Do you have to put stuff into all the columns? No. In fact, you can insert just into the columns you wish. Be careful with that, though, because in some cases, you'll have fields that require content and you're not putting it in, like an ID field, for example. In some cases, ID fields auto-generate their value. We haven't talked about that much yet, but that's something to, to keep in mind. Another thing that you can do is you can actually populate a table by running a query from another table. And that's what they're indicating here. So it says insert into artist in these field or column name order the results of this query that I'm doing from a separate database. And when you structure that separate query, make sure that the order in which you're selecting things is the order in which they need to be inserted into the other table. Hopefully that, that's clear, right? So let me, let me ask you guys this. What if, what if I do this and I, and I superimpose first name and last name? We've got a problem, right? What do you do in that case? Truncate and get rid of everything and do it over again? Well, you don't want to get rid of the stuff that's already there. But yeah, you, you have to be really careful how you structure it. If you do a lot of the work up front ordering things, then you'll have much less of an issue in the afternoon. Right, so I'm down to slide number 51 now, and we're talking about the update command. Think of the update command as similar to insert. Insert actually creates a new row in your table. Okay. Update finds an existing row and changes whatever information inside that row that you specify. So for example, if we want to update our customer table, we can set where the city equals New York City, we can set that value for wherever the customer ID equals 1,000. You actually filter down and find it. If I wanted to change more than one field, then I list the field and show the changed value. Pretty simple, really. It's not, not that difficult. In terms of what we do as programmers, once again, Insert and update, probably the two most common things we do as programmers. Insert probably more so than update, uh, but update happens a lot too. Right. This one here says update customer, set city to New York City. All right. Well, that could be a problem. You notice what, the, what their warning is here? This is going to make it so all your customers are in New York City. And you know what? You can do that. Maybe you have a functional reason for doing that. Uh, but be really careful with commands like that. The bulk update can be very destructive. So what they suggest is that you do something like this, where if you're going to, you know, so like if we were in Milwaukee, for example, we'd say area code 414, and we'd set the city to Milwaukee because we know that is the case. Can't have a 414 without being in the city of Milwaukee. So that's just one other uh, thing. Another thing that's possible to do is actually updating values from another table. Uh, and this is where you want to get a little bit careful about your syntax and how you're linking things up. So here, the purchase order table, we're going to set the tax rate by running a query on an external table and then changing the value back in our table. So this is kind of a clever approach, really. So it's kind of a multi-layered query. So the tax rate 
is going to be pulled in from a separate table and then transported into ours and stored here again. Now, I'm going to argue, why do you need to do that? That's, that's a separate issue, okay? That's a logical issue. Uh, but note that it's possible. So there's probably functional reasons for it, if not uh, logical ones. Right. Next statement we're going to talk about is the merge statement. And this one, as it says here, kind of is a combo of insert and update at the same time. So you can kind of do both. And so some people think of this as kind of like the Swiss Army knife of like query commands, in, in a sense, because you can both add data if it's not already there, or change something that is already there without necessarily uh, knowing um, if something is, is present or not. So let's take a look at an example here really quick. And I'm not going to give you anything that's complicated to work on, at least I don't think so. <laughs> um, but, but if you start reading the query here, it says merge into artist as a using artist data research as ADR. Oh my god, so already you're kind of like three layers deep. You guys see that? All right. So what they're trying to say here is we're looking at the artist table, which we're referring to as A. So you guys got to catch these little references, right? And so when I take the last name and the first name from the artist table, I'm matching it with the artist's last and first name in this table, artist data research, which they have abbreviated as ADR. So once you get past that part, it's really the artist table. So we're going to merge into the artist table using the artist data research table. So first, we're checking to see that that key piece of information is linked together. When they're matched, then update the nationality, the date of birth, and the deceased date, all from the same table. So we're taking it from the one table and merging it into the other. See, see the advantage here? Why you might want to do this? And then when it's not matched, then we'll go ahead and insert the values that we get into the other table. But if they are matched, we're grabbing the stuff that's already there. Just, just a simple way of working with multiple tables. Now, in my mind, whenever I've used the merge command, it's always to do things that are very similar to this. So I have one table, it's got all this stuff in it, I want another table that's similar so I can do these other transactions or whatever with it. And it'll be a scenario like this. It's just a way to kind of both create a table and pull data from a different table at the same time. You can use this command in different ways though that can be kind of destructive. And so with that, I, I caution it. But in this example, I think this is a really nice example that the author put together. Pretty, it seems really complicated, but it really is not. All right, moving on to the, the delete statement. Um, and this is pretty simple, all right? So, the command is delete from customer and notice the where command filters down where the customer ID equals a thousand. So if I run this, it will delete that customer from the customer table. They're gone. They give you uh, the problem here says if you omit the where clause, you will delete every row of the table. Be really, really, really careful with this command once again drops, deletes, any of this, anything that's destructive, be really careful with it. Now you might have functional reasons to remove things, I get that, right? But I always think of data as like, well if I don't need this customer information, it doesn't mean I necessarily have to delete it at the same time. It's not always a reason to delete something. And just because, like, let's say you created a file on your computer, maybe you don't use that file much, but it's not necessarily a reason to delete it. Maybe there is. But see, sometimes when you delete stuff, you screw stuff up. The problem with the database is you can't pull it back. So be really careful with the command. If you're deleting, make sure that you have some sort of a filter on there. Um, now the rest of the stuff that's in this chapter, I'm just like kind of doing a quick tri you know, step through here, is not stuff that we're gonna talk about today, okay? So let's take a five minute break. We're gonna come back and pick up with the homework, okay?